We're here at Kirbet Qumran. In the first century, this was home to a Jewish sect that some scholars identify with the Essenes. More recently, it was home to the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the greatest discoveries in the history of biblical archaeology. Kirbet Qumran is an ancient site in the Judean desert. It was occupied briefly during the period of the divided monarchy, which came to an end following the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. It was resettled in the second century BC and abandoned once more following the first Jewish-Roman war. At this time, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. It has a history filled with debate and controversy, but there are many things that Christians can learn from exploring this fascinating site. Qumran is located only about a mile northwest of the Dead Sea. It sits about nine miles south of Jericho and 14 miles east of Jerusalem. The area in which it's located is now known as the West Bank. The Dead Sea sits over 1,300 feet below sea level, the lowest point on planet Earth. It enjoys an average of 330 sunny days a year and receives less than two inches of rainfall annually. Although summer temperatures can reach over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, winter temperatures range between the high 60s and low 70s. The area in which the Qumran community was located is arid and desolate. Although it is nearly lifeless, there is a kind of stark beauty here. The sky is blue and cloudless. The Dead Sea is still visible from the settlement today. The terrain is rugged. Some would call this one of the most beautiful deserts in the world a desert that became the location for a sizable community of Jewish dwellers. I imagine that the people of Qumran went to the Dead Sea and the Qumran area because it was so desolate, because it was so distant from the rest of life and from the threats of people destroying their work. It would also protect them from invaders. It would protect them from Roman authorities who would not be plentiful in that area. We don't know the exact identity of the people who lived at Qumran, but we do know that they lived an isolated communal life. Because of this, some scholars have connected them to the Essenes, a Jewish sect that existed during the time of Jesus. This group was dedicated to the strictest observance of the Mosaic Law. We do know a few things about the community here at Qumran. We know that it was comprised of mostly adult males. There is a graveyard to the east of the settlement with over a thousand graves and in many ways it resembles a modern graveyard. The graves were ordered very neatly and the dead would receive a headstone after burial. French archeologist Roland Devaux excavated at Qumran in the early 1950s and found that these burials were mostly adult men. There were very few women and no children. Regardless of their precise identity, the residents here lived an ascetic life that was just as harsh as the environment in which their community was located. These particular figures withdrew to this remote spot. They separated themselves in association with Jerusalem and the temple. The community seems to have lived an ascetic life with significant and stringent regulations concerning membership, the ownership of property, communal activities, education, and especially dedication to the Torah. As a separatist group emphasizing a, a radical notion of purity, this remote site served their withdrawal very well. Qumran was home to a settlement of about 200 people, and it was very modest. The walls were field stones. The floors were dirt floors or flagstone pavement. There's no ornamentation, no paintings, no mosaics. The lifestyle they lived here was one that was very austere. The residents here were deeply concerned with ritual purity. We can determine this from the presence of ritual bathing pools called mikvaot. A mikveh had a set of steps by which residents would descend into the pool on one side, immerse themselves in water, and ascend the stairs on the opposite side. This practice had some similarities to Christian baptism, 
but was used here for the purpose of achieving a state of ritual purity. Those who defiled themselves in any of various different ways were required to ritually wash through immersion. And in fact, it does seem to be an act that was administered by the individual to himself. It's worth noting that this differs from Christianity, where immersion is the point of entry into the church community. It is only done one time. And in the Christian religion, this immersion, called baptism, is clearly tied to repentance, to confession, and salvation from coming wrath. When you put these pieces together and we think back to the Qumran environment, obviously the practice of immersion, especially on a frequent basis, would require access to a large water supply. The community here had an interconnected system of pools and water reservoirs that was filled by the nearby Wadi Qumran. A wadi is a riverbed that is dry most of the year, but when it rains in the mountains, a wadi will fill up very quickly and produce a raging torrent of water. These flash floods are incredibly destructive and can wipe out virtually everything in their path. But the community at Qumran figured out how to channel this water into their pools and ritual baths by means of an aqueduct. Although this flooding happened only a couple of times a year, these rare instances provided enough water for the community year-round. Literature discovered at Qumran gives us some insight into the beliefs of the people who lived here. This group had a distinctive set of beliefs and practices that set them apart from other Jewish sects, such as the Pharisees and Sadducees. At the time that the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, there were a number of these sectarian groups within Judaism. There were the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees, there were the Zealots, and then there were these individuals out at Qumran that subscribed to a peculiar way of life and to peculiar doctrines of their own. The residents of Qumran had messianic and apocalyptic beliefs and referred to themselves as the Sons of Light. They believed that God would help them triumph in battle over another group called the Sons of Darkness. They followed a figure called the Teacher of Righteousness who called them to live holy lives. The residents here lived a life of ritual purity disconnected from the outside world. At first glance, this could seem self-righteous and judgmental, but the literature discovered here reflects a deep religious conviction characterized by humility and dependence upon God. In one line of the Hodayot, or Thanksgiving scroll, the writer rejoices by saying, I thank you, for you have dealt wondrously with dust and mightily with a creature of clay. A passage like this makes us think of biblical texts like Psalm 9-1, which says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Other passages in the Hodeyot demonstrate a reliance upon God. The wicked of the people rush against me with their afflictions, and all the day long they crush my soul. But you, oh my God, turn the tempest to a whisper, and the life of the distressed you have brought to safety, as a bird from the snare, and as prey from the power of lions. When discussing the beliefs of the Qumran community, we naturally turn to the greatest treasure the site offers, an archaeological discovery we know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Sometime during the winter of 1946, or the spring of 1947, a young Bedouin shepherd by the name of Muhammad Adib discovered the scrolls. He stumbled upon the cave in which some of the scrolls were hidden while searching for a lost animal. He found seven complete or nearly complete manuscripts in all, and thus the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. After changing hands numerous times, the first scrolls wound up in the hands of scholars who recognized their value. They figured that if a few scrolls had been found, there might be more. So from 1947 until about 1956, scholars systematically combed the area. They would find over 900 scrolls in 11 different caves. This was the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a remarkable discovery of some 900 different texts found really that ranged from the 3rd century BC to the 1st century because of the arid and dry climate and because of the uh, area around the Dead Sea being so dry, you see the preservation of these texts that have given us one of the greatest archeological and textual finds in history. 
The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in caves just like this one above me. In Cave 1, the scrolls were found in earthenware jars, and so they were very well preserved. In Cave 4, they were found just scattered about on the floor. They were not as well preserved, but there were over 500 found in that one cave alone. These caves contain anywhere from a single fragment to a few dozen manuscripts. Cave 3 contained the famous Copper Scroll, a map listing what seems to be 64 different sites where gold and silver treasures and sacred objects were hidden. So far, no one has successfully deciphered it. Another famous site was Cave 11, where the last of the scrolls was discovered. The greatest find here was the Temple Scroll, the longest of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It essentially rewrites the law and offers details concerning religious regulations pertaining to the Temple in Jerusalem. The Dead Sea Scrolls date from about 250 BC until the middle of the first century AD. They were written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Copying these documents was a long and laborious task. Excavators identified one room at the site as the location where scrolls were produced. This identification was made partly on the basis of the discovery of inkwells. Because inkwells are so rare, it suggests that this was where the scrolls were copied or at least assembled. Scholars have identified this room as the scriptorium. This is where the Jewish scribes would have put together the books we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. If we were to go back in time, we could imagine long tables filled with individual pages waiting for the scribes to stitch them together. But why were the scrolls hidden in the caves? The belief is that the community here hid them shortly before the Roman army advanced upon the area. The first Jewish-Roman war took place in AD 66 to 73. In AD 66, the Roman general Vespasian was appointed by Emperor Nero to suppress the Jewish revolt. He oversaw Roman military operations until he left for Rome in AD 69 to become emperor. Vespasian left his son Titus in charge. Titus presided over the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The arch commemorating this victory still stands in Rome today, showing Roman forces carrying off treasures from the temple in Jerusalem. Qumran was destroyed by the Roman army in AD 68, but residents had already hidden the scrolls for safekeeping. Some of the caves can only be accessed from within the community, so it seems the inhabitants fully intended to come back to reclaim the scrolls, but they weren't able to do so and so the scrolls remained hidden until their discovery in 1947. Today, the majority of the scrolls may be found in the Israel Museum, although a few are held in private collections around the world. The centerpiece of this collection is a replica of the copy of Isaiah discovered in Cave One. The Great Isaiah Scroll is housed in the Shrine of the Book in Jerusalem. It was one of the very best preserved of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this copy of Isaiah's prophecy was produced a century before the birth of Christ, and yet it contains centuries-old messianic prophecies about his birth, his life, and his death. When we consider the value of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can hardly overestimate their contribution to our understanding of the Bible. The manner in which the Jews copied ancient scrolls ensured that they would have reliable manuscripts that were faithful to the originals. Prior to the discovery of the scrolls, the earliest copies of the books of the Hebrew Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament, dated to the Middle Ages. Prior to the late 1940s, the oldest Hebrew manuscript of the Old Testament scriptures was the Aleppo manuscript that dated to roughly A.D. 935. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls date to the first and second century before Christ. Now that's quite a difference in terms of time, and so that gave the skeptic and the critic really some ammunition to use uh, in regard to the Bible. Number one, they would argue that the prophecies were written after the fact, that is, those prophecies about Jesus. And number two, they suggested, because of this long time span, that the Bible somehow had changed over time, that we really didn't have the Bible today that they had prior to the time of Christ. And, of course, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls really dismantled all of that and helps us then to know that we can have confidence in the Scriptures, to know that the prophecies about Jesus were all written well before the fact, and that, number two, the Bible that we have today really has not changed substantially at all. Prior to 1945, 
the typical scholar might have said that we have no way of knowing how accurately the scribes had copied the biblical text. They would have said that it would be impossible to know just how many additions, deletions, or other alterations had been made. With as much as 2,000 years of copying, scholars, and certainly skeptics and critics, would have said that the original text of the Hebrew Bible was completely irrecoverable. Usually with texts from antiquity, our oldest copies were made a thousand years or more after the original document was penned. The Dead Sea Scrolls stand at least a millennium closer to the original authorship than the Aleppo Codex does. In addition, the Dead Sea Scrolls allow us to be confident that the Hebrew Scriptures in our Bibles really are the same as what Jesus or even Paul would have studied. Thanks to the Dead Sea Scrolls, we know that the scribes were exceedingly careful in their work. We have to praise the scribes for their accuracy, but we shouldn't find it surprising either. These men weren't just copying works of great literature, they were copying what they believed to be the very words of God. From the time of Moses, the Word of God has been written down, reduced to stone tablet or paper form, so that everybody can see it, everybody can understand it, everybody can follow it. The people at Qumran held up God's Word in great esteem, and they went to great lengths to preserve God's Word, and it's the same in the New Testament, where Jesus' words are written down, and the words of the apostles are written down, and they still form the very basis of our faith. They are our connection to Christ. What can we as Christians take away from studying the ancient community at Qumran, and what spiritual treasures can we discover? First, we have to get out into the world. When we look at the community that lived at Qumran, we see that they were intensely concerned with ritual purity. They observed it much more strictly than any other Jewish sect. They essentially withdrew into their own community in the wilderness and separated themselves from everyone else. We may feel a similar temptation in the church. We may be tempted to look at all the evil in the world and retreat inside the walls of the church using it as a safe haven or spiritual bunker. This may have been the mindset of the Qumran community, but it was the opposite of what Jesus taught. In the Gospels, we find him seeking out the very people that polite society would have labeled as socially undesirable. These are the very people Jesus made a concerted effort to reach. The Qumran community's isolation represented a flight from the world, from those deemed impure in some fashion. In contrast, Christianity doesn't represent a withdrawal from the world. There is a rejection of the world's values and practices in favor of those advocated by Jesus and taught in the Scriptures. But Christianity seeks to reach out and influence the world positively. The Great Commission itself emphasizes engagement, not a flight from those in our, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nations. It's worth noting the Essenes existed in the days of Jesus but he did not attach himself to them. He did not emulate their withdrawal. He engaged, and frankly, so must we today. Secondly, everyone is invited. Christianity isn't just about reaching out to the world. It's about extending the open invitation for others to become part of the body of Christ. At Qumran, the community was exclusive. Not everyone was able to join. Prospective members had to undergo an initiation process that might last as long as three years. The community was closed to outsiders, but this provides a vivid contrast with the teachings of the New Testament. In Matthew 28, Jesus issues the Great Commission, telling us to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. One of the reasons that the Great Commission is so great, that is, of going into all the world and preaching the gospel, is that its message was intended for every race, for every gender, for every nationality, for every ethnic group. Truly, it is a message for all. God wants everyone to be saved. Third, salvation is for all. Paul makes a similar claim in Galatians 3, when he indicates that the community of faith is open to men and women, Jews and non-Jews, and members of all classes and socioeconomic strata in society. 
There can be no discrimination between them. James warns against this very thing when telling believers not to show favoritism to the wealthy or to discriminate against the poor. When a person today is baptized into Christ, they become a part of the family of God, the church of our Lord, the church of Jesus Christ. And as a part of that family, each of those individuals stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Everyone has an equal opportunity to experience salvation through the work of Christ on the cross. And unlike the harsh, ascetic life like the one practiced at Qumran, Jesus tells us that his yoke is easy and that his burden is light. Finally, while there are many lessons to be learned from studying the Qumran community, perhaps the greatest lesson of all can be garnered from the treasures themselves. While the scrolls are priceless, their existence provides testimony for the reliability of the biblical text. The Dead Sea Scrolls provide another reminder that Christianity is founded upon credible evidence, evidence that a believer should be prepared to share with others. Our faith as Christians is not based upon some myth or fable or it's not based upon some blind leap in the dark. Our faith is built upon evidences. And over centuries, archeology span has given us a multitude of evidences that really give us a rational and logical reason to believe. Qumran holds valuable lessons for us as Christians. The people who live there give us an example of determined commitment to God, but their beliefs also provide a contrast to the uniqueness and remarkable openness of Christianity. The Dead Sea Scrolls give believers everywhere confidence that our Bibles are reliable. Thanks to the Jewish scribes and their meticulous methods of copying the manuscripts, we have priceless copies of the biblical text that are over 2,000 years old. These artifacts reveal a treasure trove of information and a priceless message of hope. You are the heavens and I am a star. You are the thunder and I am a whisper. Quietly longing to be where you are. Quietly longing to be where you are. You are almighty God. When you first arrive, the secluded Qumran area is um, unassuming. A largely barren and grayish surface gives way to well, the deep furrows and sharp drops at the edge of a wadi or a water course. Attention-grabbing caves appear in the walls of those furrows. The entire setting lies in the foreground of a quite different looking ruddy and jagged hillside that's not very far to the west. At first glimpse, I found the scene ruggedly appealing, but probably exceptional only to maybe a determined hiker or a curious spelunker. But the natural beauty belies the significance of this area and the events of its history. When we put together the rough beauty of this place with the knowledge of its past and the treasures that were only recently discovered, then the site takes on a new, extraordinary appeal. Quite simply, the Qumran site proved to be an exceptional stop in our travels across the Bible lands. Getting to visit Qumran and see the place where the Dead Sea Scrolls were written provides a kind of sober exhilaration. Uh, it's exhilarating because you're getting to step back in time and visit a site where Jesus' contemporaries lived and worked and worshipped. And yet it's sobering at the same time because the whole reason why we have Dead Sea Scrolls is because these people in this community had to hide them. They had to hide them in the face of Roman legions who were descending upon Judea. <laughs>